surprise for you today. I'm in. Are you guys feeling hungry? Well, I was around the woods today and got myself some rabbits. Yeah, still fresh. Um, oh, are you doing okay, Eric? Is this your first time seeing her? Well, sorry, my dear. Just sit down. I'll make you some more chocolate, okay? Here you go now. I should make you feel better. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm kind of used to seeing something like that. I've always seen it growing up. Okay, just calm down. Take a deep breath. Uh, no. You're feeling better. I mean, it's, it's the circle of life. There's nothing you should be worried about. Okay, okay. Don't, don't start crying. It's okay. That was no baby rabbit or mama rabbit. It was alone sad old rabbit that it's full time enjoying their life okay just breathe in <sighs> now why don't I tell you a scary story so you would forget all about what I showed you today and you won't tell your parents about it sounds good well we were reading a story last time weren't we about bedtimes. Shall we continue? Yeah, okay, good. Let's continue. So the story began with our protagonist who seemed to be having trouble sleeping, but day after day he became accustomed to his nightly visitors until one most terrifying Gradually, the room was once again dark. As my eyes adjusted, I could gradually make out the window and the door and the walls. Some toys on a shelf and even to this day, I shudder to think of it, for there was no noise. No rustling of sheets, no movement at all. The room felt lifeless. Lifeless yet not empty. The nightly visitor, that unwelcome, wheezing, hate-filled thing which had terrorized me night after night, was not in the bottom bunk. It was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaking the very sound from my voice. I lay motionless. If I could not scream, I did not want to let it know I was awake. I had not yet seen it. I could only feel it. It was obscured under my blanket. I could see its outline and I could feel its presence, but I dared not to look. The weight of it pressed down on top of me, a sensation I will never forget. When I say that hours passed, I do not exaggerate. Laying there motionless in the darkness, I was every bit as scared and frightened. the summer months, it would have been light by then, but the grasp of winter is long and unrelenting, and I knew it would be hours before sunrise, a sunrise which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature, but I reached a breaking point, a moment where I could wait no more, where I could survive under this intimately deviant abomination. Fear can sometimes wear you out, make you threadbare, a shell of nerves, leaving only the slightest trace of you behind. I had to get out of the bed. And then I remembered the crucifix. My hand still lay underneath the pillow, but it was empty. I slowly moved my wrist around to find it, minimizing as best I could the sound and vibration caused. But it could not be found. I had either knocked it off the top bunk or it had. I could not even bear to think of it had taken from my hand. Without the crucifix, I lost any sense of hope. Even at such a young age, you can be acutely aware of what death is and intensely frightened of it. I knew I was going to die in that bed if I lay there. 
was resting, believing that it finally got me, that I was finally in its grasp, or perhaps it was toying with me. After all, it had been doing just that for countless nights, and now with me under it, pinned against my mattress with my mother to protect me, maybe was holding off, savoring its victory until the last possible moment, like a wild animal savoring its prey. I tried to breathe as shallowly as possible and mustering every ounce of courage I could. I reached over slowly with my right hand and began to peel the blanket off me. What I would find under those cover almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but as my hand moved the blanket, it brushed against something. Something smooth and cold. Something which felt unmistakably like a cold. I held my breath in terror as I was sure it must now have known that I was awake. Nothing. It did not stir. It felt dead. After a few moments, I placed my hand carefully further down the blanket and felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confident and almost twisted sense of curiosity grew as I moved down further to a disproportionately larger bicep muscle. The arm was outstretched, lying across my chest, with the hand resting on my left shoulder, as if it had been grabbed in my sleep. I realized that I would have to move this cadaverous appendage if I even so much as hoped to escape its grasp. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing on the shoulder of this nighttime invader stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled in my stomach and in my chest. As I recalled my hand in disgust at the touch of straggled, oily hair, I could not bring myself to touch its face, although I wondered to this very day what it would have felt like. Dear God, it moved. It moved. It was subtle, but its grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No dear, it's game, but God, I, I wanted to cry. At stand and arm slowly coiled around me, my right leg brushed along the cool wall which the bed lay against. Of all that happening to me in that room, this was the strangest. I realized that this clutching rancid thing which drew great delight from violating a young boy's bed was not entirely on top of me. It was sticking out from the wall like a spider striking from its lair. Suddenly its grip moved from a slow, tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed at my clothes, as if it frightened that the opportunity would soon pass. I fought against it, but its emaciated arm was too strong for me. Its head rose up, writhing and contorting under the blanket. I now realized where it was taking me, into the wall. I fought for my dear life. I cried, and suddenly my voice returned to me, yelling and screaming, but no one came. Then I realized why I was so eager to suddenly strike, and why this thing had to have me now. Through my window, that window which seemed to represent so much malice from outside, streaked hope. The first rays of sunshine, I struggled further knowing that if I could just hold on, it would soon be gone. As I fought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted, slowly pulling itself up my chest, its head now poking up from the under the blanket, wheezing and coughing and rasping. I did not remember its features, I simply remember its breath against my face, foul and as cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon, the dark place, that suffocating room of contempt, was washed, bathed in sunlight. Wow, this story is written beautifully, don't you think? <laughs> oh, you want another round of hot cocoa? Yeah, sure. Here you go. I passed out at the scrawny fingers and circled my neck, squeezing the very life from me. I awoke to my father, offering to make me some breakfast. A wonderful sight indeed. I 
almost inaudible sound of someone else in the room breathing in and out do not cease. It continued rhythmically and without a pause. I lay there in the darkness, but while I was still recovering from the terror instilled in me from my experiences in my previous bedroom, I was not entirely afraid. The breathing was so distant and unlike the wheezing I had heard during my encounter with that thing in the wall, that I remained calm. And even at that early age, I believed that it was so subtle that it was probably my imagination playing tricks on me. Still, I took no chances. I stepped out of the bed, walked across the room and turned the lights on. The sound had gone. I stared at that old worn armchair facing the foot of my bed, which was within reaching distance of where I slept, and turned it around to face the other way. I had no real reason to do so, but something about it sitting there filled me with dread. I know what this boy means. I also have a similar chair in the corner of my living room. You know, the chair that you never actually sit on? Yeah, sometimes. I feel like I can't sit on, not because it's just not where I prefer to sit, but sometimes it feels like there's something already sitting on it. You know what I mean? I think we all have a chair like that. But anyway. The night. Oh, it started raining. Well, this is getting kind of crazy, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, the third night, I was not so fearless. Again, I awoke in darkness, lying on my back. I stared up at the ceiling, which seemed to happily absorb the dim orange light from the street. The trees outside my window swayed in a calm breeze, casting a strange collection of improbable moving shadows across the room. I could hear nothing but the long and distant hum of the city night's traffic. Just as I began to drift back into sleep, I heard it. A creak from the bottom of my bed, as if something had moved or shifted its weight onto the floor. I raised my head, peering through darkness, but saw nothing strange. Everything sat as it had done throughout the day. Nothing was out of place. Cast my gaze across the room, some comics on the floor, a few boxes which had still to be unpacked, the armchair unmoved, still facing away from the bottom of my bed. There was nothing sinister here. I was now fully awake, glancing over at my television, considering whether or not to enjoy some late night tea. I'd have to keep the volume low, of course, as my older brother would hear it in the next room and no doubt tell me to switch it off. Just as I sat up fully in bed, I heard it again. A low creak, accompanied by a sound. The sound of the slightest of movements. I looked again at the room, the dim orange shadow cast by the leaves hanging by my window now took on a more menacing form. I still saw no reason to be afraid. I stared at the chair at the end of my bed and saw nothing unusual about it. It's quite common for the mind to take a moment to fully come to terms with what it is seeing. It takes time to pull the horror of what it is in front of you together into a moment of cold, bitter realization. Yes, I was staring armchair in the dark, but what I was also staring at was the person sitting in it. In the dim light, I could only see the outline of the back of its head, the rest obscured by the spine of the chair. I sat motionless, staring, praying, hoping that my eyes were being misled by their surroundings. The slow creak of movement as it shifted in its battered throne chilled me to my very core. This was no mere trick of the dark. Then it shifted on its right side. I knew what it was doing. It was turning to look at me. It was
I scream. 